So this morning, uh, we're going to be in the book of, the book of Psalms. You can turn to Psalm 30 if you brought your Bibles, you got your phones, it'll be a lot faster. You don't have to rush there just yet. Um, and Psalms is a, is a beautiful book, and, it, and we wrestle a lot going through the Psalms with emotions and metaphor and just passion, right? A passionate relationship with God, whether it's hurting or whether it's exuberant praise. That is the book of Psalms to me. Um, and um, we're going to go over what's called a psalm of thanksgiving. There's different genres of psalms. Um, and before we go into Psalm 30, a psalm of thanksgiving, uh, I wanted to give you guys just a real quick overview of the, the three main genres of psalms that exist. Um, just like we have different genres of music and types of songs today, ballads, party songs, EDM, I love it, love songs, reflective songs. So too in the book of Psalms we see an array of different types that David and other authors use to express themselves to God, to motivate him to act, to ask him to act, and to use his hymns and liturgy for the whole community of faith. Um, and so there's three main ones. There's praise, there's lament, and there's thanksgiving. There's thanksgiving. Um, Praise psalms contain an appeal, whether it's to yourself, sometimes these guys talk to themselves when they're writing, or to others to praise God, coupled with numerous descriptions of his praiseworthy name, his deeds, his attributes, his character. The focus in a praise psalm is on God's role as creator, sustainer, and stabilizer of the universe. Think Genesis 1. He looked at everything he had made and it was good. And that's humanity's sole assurance of continued stability and, re and reliability in a chaotic world. God the sustainer. That's a praise psalm. For the most part, praise psalms, and here's a key distinction, they admit no hint of suffering or disorder. Rather, they express an awe-filled sense of confidence in God's power, his authority, and everlasting character displayed both in the world of nature and in human affairs. An example of this is Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. It fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You've taught, the chil you've taught children and infants to tell of your strength. When I look at the night sky and I see the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them, yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made then it goes through the taxonomy of all the creatures and then it says O oh Lord O oh Lord how majestic is your name that fills all the earth so again that's a praise psalm it's beautiful it's it's exuberant about just God's character but there's no mention of suffering there's no dissonance or anything wrong with the world that's mentioned <clears throat> rather God you are majestic and mighty and awesome and you designed everything to reflect that ultimately Praise psalms are more general and expansive. They're not specific. Number two, lament. <clears throat> lament, by contrast, the lament psalms direct their appeal to God himself. It's not describing God, it's addressing God. Seeking deliverance from trouble and distress. The world of the lamenting psalmist is fully aware of the realities of suffering, disorder, sin, and oppression that are part of living in the world. Indeed, the laments find their focus on recounting how life has run amok despite the power and grace of God. They see a disconnect between who God is and the universe he created, and yet what I'm looking at boots on the ground, the state of the world and the state of my life. That's a lament psalm. Experience of pain often drives the authors of the Psalms to question the sure foundation represented by God's creative power and sustaining authority that you see in praise Psalms. They experience God as distant or occasionally even hostile, as in Psalm 88. He says, I cry day and night, you have overwhelmed me. You see, God is hostile, but they come to God with their suffering. 
That's the key. This is done in the context of a covenant that they have with God. And that disconnect that they see doesn't cause them to just, oh, whatever. But they come to him and say, God, there is a problem. I see dissonance. I see a disconnect. That is a lament psalm. And they petition him to act on their behalf. Because despite their suffering, they lean and depend on the fact that they are in that covenant relationship. An example of this is Psalm 6. I'll read a few excerpts. Be gracious to me, O Lord. Be gracious to me, because I'm weak. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are shaking. My whole being is shaken with terror. And you, O Lord, how long? See, the psalmist feels God is distant, almost as if he's not listening. Turn, Lord, rescue me, save me, because of your faithful love. There's the covenant. Because of your faithful love. I am weary from my groaning. With my tears, I dampen my pillow and drench my bed every night. My eyes are swollen from grief. They grow old because of all my enemies. The lament is an intense, honest appeal to God. It's not simple conversation or a description of a situation, but a call on God to act on behalf of the psalmist, to be faithful to the psalmist who is in his covenant community. The last one is a psalm of thanksgiving, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Thanksgiving psalms occupy a territory that lies somewhere between praise and lament. Like the laments, the thanksgiving psalms are only too, too well aware of the reality of pain and suffering in all its forms. The heart of almost every thanksgiving song, psalm has a narrative of sin, betrayal, oppression, suffering, or threat. What sets it apart from a lament is that this threat, this suffering is viewed in the past. It's viewed as something that happened, and specifically that God acted to right it. That God acted to fix a situation. So, so in Thanksgiving Psalms, alongside this very real awareness of pain and suffering in life, they reaffirm a confidence in God's ability to save. So if you start with a lament, God answers, you get a thanksgiving psalm where they recount, here's what I was going through, here's what God did. It's a very specific prayer. It's a very specific prayer. Um, and it's important to remember that. They're not generic. Uh, I think sometimes we could think maybe of a, of a thanksgiving psalm as almost like, God, thanks for being awesome today. That's awesome, you know. Um, but that would be more like a praise psalm. Rather, they're specific. God, you acted this way specifically in response to my appeal to you. I prayed and you answered. And I'm going to tell the whole community of faith, this is what God did for me. This is how awesome God is. He did this for me and it was amazing. And sometimes there's not a lot of specifics. They can be a little generic, but ultimately it rests on the foundation of I prayed and God answered. Sometimes... And there's a lot of different situations that people face when these psalms come out. Sometimes it's, it's maybe what we're used to if you just read through the book of Psalms on your own where you see David running from his enemies, for instance, and he prays for an actual physical deliverance like, God, you need to stop these people. They're trying to kill me. I'm your king. Other times, it's a psalmist struggling with doubt like Asaph in Psalm 73. Sometimes it's betrayal like David in Psalm 22 that we see quoted later in the New Testament about Jesus but it's always, God, you heard my cry. You delivered me out of that situation. Thank you. And ultimately, a thanksgiving psalm leads to magnifying God's greatness and acts as a motive for further obedience. Essentially, how can I not serve and honor and worship you? And three, beyond the person who an to whom God answered, this, testi this testimony affects the community as a whole. As a whole. When we hear people say, in front of the whole congregation, in front of the whole faith community, God answered me. We ourselves are motivated. We're encouraged to think, God, you are wonderful. You are loving. You do answer our prayers. You do hear us when we cry. And so we're going to look at one of those Thanksgiving Psalms. So Psalm 30. And it's broken up into three sections. The first section is kind of a general introduction and a call to praise. The second section is when David outlines a little bit more detail. Here's what I, w here's what I went through. And then the final section is, and, here's, and then God answered. So, verses 1 through 3. A psalm, a dedication song for the house, or it could be the temple. 
of David. I will exalt you, Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not allowed my enemies to triumph over me. Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you healed me. Lord, you brought me up from Sheol. You brought me back to life from among those going down to the pit. So the psalm opens with this boisterous, exultant praise. I will exalt you, God. Why, David? Because he answered me. Because he answered me. Now, you see in verses 1 through 3, exactly what was happening to David was ambiguous. He doesn't get specific in this opening section as to what was going on. It's vague. But we do know how he felt about the situation that he was in and what he was experiencing. Pay attention to the language he uses about God. You lifted me up. The verb conveys the sense of being drawn out of water. You lifted me up. You brought me up. You healed me. Verse 2, you preserved me from descending into a pit. Verse 3, and later in verse 11, spoiler alert, you turned my lament into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Now remember, psalms of thanksgiving were answers to what was originally a lament, a cry to God for help. I was this, but you that. So if God, think about the situation that David was in for a second. If God lifted him up, healed him, brought me back from death, revived me, clothed me with joy, what does that mean? I was drowning. I was wounded. I was camped out in a place of death and nothingness. That's what Sheol was in their mind whenever you see that word. The land of the dead. And I was clothed with sadness. Remember, you exchanged my, my sackcloth for joy. I was clothed with sadness. Think about the expression that he uses there. And, and if you look at verse 11, you removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Sackcloth was just cheap utility fabric for storing bags of grain and stuff like that. It was dreadfully uncomfortable. It wasn't for wearing. It was what people put on when someone died. It was funeral clothes. It was how you let the community know you were grieving deeply a loss of someone. And when David uses that term here, it's not literal. A relative hadn't just died or something. Rather, it's a metaphor. Remember, the Psalms are poetry. It's a metaphor. He was clothed literally with grief. He was clothed with grief. Grief covered him like a jacket. He wore it around every day. I know many of us can relate to that metaphor. Walking around always accompanied by our sorrows, our griefs, the threat that we're under, as if they were clothes we wear. It's a grim picture, like the lament psalm that I read in the beginning, Psalm 6. But here David is rejoicing. Why? That deep place of darkness, God brought him out of it. At first he says, I will lift you up, God. And then in verses 4 and 5, he moves toward the whole community. You guys too, this is great. Verse 4, sing to Yahweh, you his faithful ones, and praise his holy name. You guys. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but there's joy in the morning. There's joy in the morning. So David is so excited. He's so thrilled about the fact that God saw him in this place of deep despair that when he rescues him, he can't contain himself. And he looks at the whole community and says, praise God with me. This is incredible. He saves. He works. He heard me. He heard me. In the community, okay, tell us why, David. Tell us why. So then David moves to get a little more specific in verse 6. When I was secure, verse 6, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you showed your favor, you made me stand like a strong mountain. But when you hid your face, I was terrified. Lord, I called to you. I sought favor from my Lord. And he says, what gain is there in my death, God? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your truth? Verse 10, Lord, listen and show me kindness. 
Lord, be my help. So verse 6, when I was secure, I said, I will never be shaken. So David says, while I was in a position of safety and security, or the word secure there is literally ease. When I was in ease, so life, when life was good and peachy, David said he'd forgotten that that ease and security came from God. Essentially, he'd forgotten how utterly dependent he was on God for everything. A curious thing for a man like David to forget when you consider his journey to becoming king. Remember, he was anointed and then on the run for literally 20 years before finally being installed. It's a curious thing for David to forget, but I know I can speak for myself and many of us when I say I've seen myself forget too. So he'd forgotten how dependent he was on God for everything, and he got a reminder, and he recounts that in verse 7. Lord, when you showed your favor, you made me stand like a strong mountain, but when you hid your face, I was terrified. So David gets a wake-up call. Again, still not entirely sure what happened. He doesn't say specifically, I was running from this guy. In some psalms he does. Or in some psalms in the heading it'll say, David wrote this when he was running from the Abimelech. Right? We're not sure in this one. But someone was obviously trying to usurp him or destroy him. Remember he mentioned my enemies up in verse 1. Somebody was after David. And knowing David's life it could have been many things. And so what did this call cause David to do? He's looking at the event in hindsight. You know, I thought I was fine, but I wasn't. And so he's looking in hindsight and he said, you know, when you hid your face, I was dismayed. What did this cause David to do? To call out to God for help. To call out to God for help. Not to wallow in self-pity. Not to, not to think, oh, I deserve this. I screwed up. But to call out to God for help. And that's exactly what he does in the next verse. The Lord I called to you. I was in that situation. I was struggling. I was hurting. I called to you. I sought favor from you, my Lord, my Master. And so that verse encapsulates the lament, the cry to God. I'm drowning. I'm suffering. I'm under threat. God, rescue, save, deliver. Be you again to me as you were before. And he goes even further in verse 9 to try to motivate God to respond. What gain is there in my death, he says to God. If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your truth? Essentially, David is saying, God, I'm one of your faithful people. I follow you and I testify to you. I sing your praises I exalt you among everyone. If you let this happen to me, if you let me be destroyed, if you let my enemies overcome me, who's going to do that? Who's going to do that? David is saying, God, I can't serve you in death and despair. And so you can imagine David is so confused about his position with God right now. God, why is this happening to me? I can't praise you. I know that's what I'm for. I can't praise you if I'm dead. You see the psalmist say that a lot. It's not the sort of thing that we say when we suffer, right? It's, it's, a, it's a curious thing that this was their worldview, but this was his worldview. I can't praise you if I'm dead. I can't praise you if I'm dead. David is locked horn to horn with God, wrestling through why this is happening to him, and he's expecting God to answer. And he concludes the lament as he's retelling it. This maybe wasn't the whole thing he prayed, but he's retelling it in a shortened version. He concludes it with verse 10. Lord, listen and show me kindness. Lord, be my help. Lord, be my help. Before we move on to the last two verses, I want to pause here for a minute. I want us to stop at this request, O oh Lord, be my help. Psalms of Thanksgiving, like I said, recount the evils of the world and the suffering of God's people. And that suffering was variegated. It could be a lot of different things. But also, 
in Psalms of Thanksgiving, there's God's wonderful, loving deliverance. But I want to stop here at the end of the request, be my help, because I know, I know that some of you, this is where you are in this process, right? You're asking God for help. You're hurting. I don't know what it is, but it ends with you feel like you're drowning. You're staring at a gaping wound in a relationship or just in your own soul. You see it. And maybe mutter the courage, muster the courage to whisper, God, be my help. And if that is you this morning, I know where you're at. I know how hard it is. I really do. Maybe it's caused you to become jaded, callous, angry, overwhelmingly sad, or just overwhelmed. And if you have, and if that is you, I want you to know that you are exactly what this psalm of thanksgiving is for. You're exactly, this psalm is speaking directly to you. This is what psalms of thanksgiving are for. And I want to encourage you to open the door for a little bit of hope right now, particularly if you're in a situation that seems hopeless. Because these next two verses, the conclusion, what happened after he prayed, they're for you. And they're coming from someone, not just any someone, but God's anointed king, King David, who had run and suffered and been betrayed and hunted for the majority of his life. This is a guy who knew what it was to suffer. That's the kind of guy it's coming from. The guy who knew suffering like almost nobody. And he wrote these verses for you. Listen to the last two verses of the psalm. Verse 11, you turned my lament into dancing. You removed my sackcloth, and instead you clothed me with, not grief anymore, but joy. So that I can sing to you and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. You turned my mourning into dancing. You loosed my sackcloth, my funeral garb, the grief that I was wearing 24-7 from when I went to bed to when I woke up and the whole day. And you took that and you took it off of me and you clothed me with joy. You heard. I was distraught. I was sad. I was overwhelmed. And you heard me. And why? It's interesting. In verse 12, he includes a so what? So that I can sing to you and not be silent. So that I can tell people, that I can invite people to praise you with me. Why? Because you are a God who hears and acts. A God who hears and acts. Do you remember when David said, will the dust praise you? In verse 9, locked horn to horn with God. And God looks down at David and says, no, David, you will. Watch this. He was heard directly. He was delivered. And he rejoices in front of the whole community. God, you did this. You did this thing. And it was amazing. When I look at a psalm of thanksgiving, and this is one of many, it was just a nice, uh, this was a good one to go through. Um, because it's pretty simple. But there's tons of them throughout Scripture, throughout the book of Psalms. There's tons of Psalms of thanksgiving. And when I look at them, if I think, what does this mean? What's the application? You know, we always have a, a point of application in the sermon. What, what's the point? What's the purpose for a Psalm of thanksgiving? And it boils down to something really, really simple. God hears and God acts and we retell it. God hears. He heard David in that pit. He acts. He delivers. And then we retell it. Like he says in verse 5. Sing to Yahweh, you his faithful ones. It's an invitation. 
an invitation to glory in the deliverance that God that God had brought about. And I know what it's like to hear that and be kind of cynical. I really do. Some of you are thinking, yeah, God shows favor to David and to other people who share stuff like this, who have testimony. But not to me. Not to me. That God is somehow partial. That someone that somehow some people just have closer relationships with God. And that's the way it is. I know what it's like to think that because I've thought that. I've thought that. But listen, it's completely, totally, and entirely untrue. If you follow Jesus, if you have given your life to him, if you've believed the message that he has, you have been seated literally right next to him in heaven. So what Paul says in Ephesians 2. Listen to this. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses, you were saved by grace. Together, verse 6, with Christ Jesus, he raised us up and seated us in the heavens, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness to us every single person who has believed. That is you. That is you. There is no hierarchy. There is no closer or further away from God when it comes to the Christian community. Each of you who has believed, all of you were brought near and are near. And whether you feel it or not right now, whether you struggle with that or if you buck against it, I did. It's true. It's true. And the access that you have is the same as Jesus himself to God it's the same as Jesus himself you're not beyond this beautiful beautiful statement that David is making that God heard him you're not beyond that you're not too far away for that if you have believed he hears you because what does scripture say we become part of his family the minute we believe the minute we believe now I chose this on the Thanksgiving because uh, I have my own testimony of thanksgiving for you all today. I know, um, and for me, it, it took a long time. It took a long time. I was waiting in pain and depression, confusion, and anger. It's why I stepped down from being an associate pastor earlier this year. Uh, because I felt that in good conscience I could not continue to serve in a leadership position when I was struggling this much with my relationship with God. I don't know many of you noticed something was up with me, and I shared it with, with some of you. Um, <clears throat> David says here in verse 5, Weeping may remain for a night, but joy comes in the morning. For me, and I know for many of you, it was, and perhaps still is, a, it was a long night for me. It seems like a, a trite statement. Oh, it's just wait till the sun comes up. It took a long time for the sun to come up for me. But I wanted to share with you what the Lord did for me. Um, kind of a, a brief picture of where I was coming from. I became a believer when I was 17, and there was a radical change in my life. I was addicted to drugs and porn and generally an arrogant person. I was. Hard as that is to believe. Um, <clears throat> and then God visited that 17-year-old teenager one Saturday morning in October. I guess I'm coming up on 11 years, 12 years. Math. And, and then a year later, and, and, and that was a radical change, and I bring it up because... The Holy Spirit was really speaking to me, and I felt so close to God during that time in my life. And a year later, it left. It ended up with me leaving engineering school. I felt very specific. God wanted me to leave engineering school and go to Moody Bible Institute to 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 become to, to go into full-time ministry to study Scripture and history and languages and everything. And so for me, 
from the inception of my relationship with God, he was so active in my life. He was active, and I heard him. And, and it ended up with me marrying my beautiful wife, Shannon, and then we went, we went to Denver, which was great, and then we ended up in Palestine, the West Bank, for two years to, to, to share the gospel with Muslims there and for me to continue my studies of the Hebrew Bible. And it was just awesome. It was awesome. And then toward the end of our stay in the West Bank, I really started to feel like God was distant. And I was trying to hear him, and I didn't know why he wasn't speaking to me. At least it didn't seem that way to me. It didn't seem that way to me. Um, and I started to get depressed, and I started to have really serious doubts of my faith. And this whole thing sort of, I won't use the word spiraled, it almost festered for and grew, you know, like mold or something. It grew over the course of a couple of years um, to the point where in December of this past year, so a little under a year ago, I was, I was struggling even with the thought that the gospel was real. I was. I, I, I was looking, because it's Christmas time, you reflect on the gospel, right? You reflect on Jesus, you reflect on who he is. And I was looking at it and I was thinking, I'm not even sure I believe this anymore, which was terrifying to me because I had oriented my entire life around God, right? I'd left everything. And, and my marriage, it was the foundation of my marriage. It was the foundation of my entire life. And then all of a sudden, that whole thing started to teeter and it was terrifying to me. And it was disorienting. It was disorienting. And throughout this whole process, I kept coming to God. What's going on? God, help me. God, what, like, please. And at first I thought I, I had ideas of what needed to happen in my mind, but it, I, it, it so clouded me after a while. It so clouded me and who I was that I didn't even know what I needed anymore. I didn't even know what I needed anymore. And the whole time I felt God is being silent. And I was completely disoriented from this whole experience, you can imagine. And it went on long enough that I became angry. I became angry because I had given my life to God and I felt like he was leaving me out to dry. It seems strange to cry out to a God who knows and sees everything. Hey, God, remember me? I'm down here. Look. Hello. Hello. It seems strange until you go through it. And that's really what I felt like I was doing. Do you remember me? Remember how I gave up my life for you? How I chose to follow you, Jesus? And so despite all this, I somehow, and I think it was totally by the grace of God, I clung deep in my soul in a place that fortunately I couldn't tear it out. I tried. I don't know how else to explain it. I clung to this conviction that God some, knew what I needed in that time of confusion and despair, that he somehow knew what I needed, and I didn't anymore. I had puzzled and turned thoughts and feelings over and over again, and then at what was clearly the prompting of the Holy Spirit, we went to, of all places on God's green earth, we went to China, me and Shannon. I have no idea to this day why we ended up there, you know. Have I ever learned Chinese out of all the languages that I've studied? No. Have I ever been to, have I really engaged that culture? No. Did I even see a need for a lot of missionaries in that culture? No. But we have friends over there and we wanted to go visit them. So that's what we did. And it was, a, it was Shannon. She just walked up to me and she's like, I think we should go to China. And, I, and we talked about it for what, four years maybe? And then she's just like out of the blue walks up and she's like, I think we should go to China. And I was like, okay, um, <laughs> let's go to China. <laughs> Which is strange, because Shannon tends to be the more frugal one in our relationship. Um, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Victoria's laughing back there. Uh, and so we go to China, and I really didn't want to go. Um, I really, I really, I didn't want to go. Because we were going to see our friends who, were, who just loved the heck out of Jesus. Loved him so much. And I was like, this is going to be uncomfortable because I'm at literally the lowest point in my life, spiritually speaking. Don't want to go, don't want to see them, don't want to have to put on a face, or even worse, be honest and have them like push back or whatever and try and fix me. I got that a lot. Um, and so we go, 
And I, I, I paint it this whole way, and I especially want to emphasize, I had this deep sense that God knew what I needed, and I wasn't sure what that was. And so we're in China. We're on a rooftop of a, of a, of, of a, a missionary who was part of the team there of our friends who we were going to visit, Nova and Ira McBee. And um, I'm on a rooftop having tea with Ira and then their teammate, uh, Brad. Brad's an awesome guy. I want you guys to meet Brad. I don't know if you ever will. And so we're sitting there having tea, and we're just talking about life. I wasn't sharing much. Like I said, I was really trying to hold my cards close to my chest as far as my, where I was at spiritually. And Brad just looks at me. It was the funniest thing. He just looks at me, and he's like, George, how's your imagination? I was like, what? <laughs> you know, I've never, I, nobody's ever asked me that before. I don't, I, I, it's good as imaginations go, I guess. I, I mean, what? You know, how's your imagination? I mean, how's your imagination, Nick? Is that all right? I, you know, I, that was my response. Nick, Nick does this, and I'm like, I don't know. It's a, it's a good imagination. He's like, all right. And so Brad felt prompted by the Holy Spirit. He told me this later. But he's like, I want you to just close your eyes for me. And I was like, okay. Close your eyes. And instead of having tea with me and Ira, I want you to imagine that you're sitting there having tea with Jesus. And then my charismatic radar goes up, and I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> but, 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 but I, um, I decided, and, I, and I, I came at this from the position of, I'm going to engage this even though this seems really weird. I'm going to engage this. So I was like, all right, I'm going to have tea with Jesus, Brad. Um, so Jesus is sitting across the table from me, and he tells me, Brad tells me, all right, I'm going to kind of walk you through an experience, and I don't want you to share with, I don't want you to say anything that's going on. I want it to just happen in your head, and, and, and we'll talk about it when it's done. I was like, okay, Brad. Okay. And... So he walks me through this experience, and he's like, all right, so picture Jesus. What's he doing? I'm not saying this, but in my head, he reached across the table. I didn't expect anything to happen, mind you, right? He, Jesus, in my imagination, my average imagination, reaches across the table, and he touched his hand on mine. And I felt this overwhelming sense of love. I mean, and I don't use overwhelming in an exaggerated way there. And I was like, wow. And then Brad says, all right, Jesus takes a piece of paper. He writes a word on it. He flips it upside down and he slides it over to you. Again, I'm picking this thing apart and I'm like, okay, this is where psychologically it's going to be something like love or hope or, you know, whatever. Because like that's the, again, I'm engaged but cr critiquing <laughs> at the same time. And so he slides the piece of paper over to me. And he's like, I want you, and then Brad's like, I want you to pick it up, flip it over, and read it. So I do this in my imagination, keeping this all to myself. And the word on the piece of paper was fear. It was fear. And so my first thought was, I'm doing this wrong. It was supposed to be, it was supposed to be love. It was supposed to be hope. You know, I'm doing this wrong. But it was fear. And then we go through the rest of it. Oh, this, this is turning into a long story. My apologies. But... We go through the rest of it, and it ends, and then Brad's like, all right, George, tell me what happened. And then Ira, my friend sitting there next to me, looks at me, and he's like, George, before you say anything, before you say anything, I want you to know, excuse me, I want you to know that the Holy Spirit carried me through that entire thing with you. And I was like, okay. And then he looks me in the eye, and he says, the word on your piece of paper was fear. Was fear. Right? Can you imagine? And so I'm sitting there and just overwhelmed with this verification for me that like God is right here next to me and he notices me. It was just indisputable. We hadn't been talking about fear. We hadn't even been talking about my life. I hadn't shared anything that I was dealing with. And fear spoke to me very personally for different reasons, but, and it was unexpected. But when Ira looked at me and said, the word on your piece of paper was fear, it was just like, if everything wasn't enough, God was like, I am right here next to you. 
I am right here next to you. And I sensed it. And I sensed that familiar presence of joy and love that I had been missing, that I had been longing for. And if you ask me, like, okay, so why did you go through that whole period? You know, those, those two, three years of really struggling and stuff. I mean, there could be a thousand reasons. I don't know. People are complicated. Anybody who studies psychology knows that people are complicated. But it was exactly what I needed. I did not know that that was what I needed. But I can't, I can't express to you how perfect that was and how that reset me spiritually. Knowing that God was there and that like he cared and that he saw me and that he loved me, sensing that, knowing that. And that's what I wanted to share with you. That's why I wanted to share a psalm of thanksgiving with you. Because God did this for me. And I know, again, my position in the church was, was weird for a while after I stepped down because people were like, what's wrong with George? There was a lot wrong with me, but I'm here to tell you that God heard me. It took years, and God heard me. And now, as Shannon likes to put it, I feel like I have my husband back. You kind of do, you know? I feel like I have my husband back because God answered those prayers in in those deepest, darkest nights of my soul, and it sucked, and I was weeping nights. I'm telling you, it was awful. God was there. He saw me. He was next to me, just like Scripture says. He's near to what? The brokenhearted. He's near to the brokenhearted. And I want to encourage you. I don't know where you're at in this process if you're grieving. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know how long it's been. I don't know how hard your marriage is. Our marriage struggled during this period. It was hard. It was really hard. I don't know what it is that you're going through. No believer, no you who are a member of the covenant community of God through Jesus Christ, he is right next to you. He hears you. I don't know what your answer is going to be. I don't know how he's going to speak to you. might be totally different. Probably will be. That was just for me. He knew what I needed. He knows you. He knows you. He hears you. He's next to you. And if you're in the middle of that dark night, be encouraged. Be encouraged that he hears you. I know that some of you who are sitting out there right now have a testimony. Your own psalm of thanksgiving. I hope it's coming to mind right now. That you have a story like that. God heard me and God answered me. God heard me and God answered me. Share that. Share that. Share that with the church. We need that encouragement. We need that reorientation. The people who are like me down in this pit... We need to hear that. That's like tilling hard soil when you hear somebody look you in the eye and be like, God heard my prayer. He heard me. He answered me. This is how amazing he is. Um, Share it in MCGs. Share it in Bible studies. Share it in Sunday mornings. Share it when you're having lunch with somebody at work. You never know who's listening. You never know who's listening. So every week at Loft City Church, we take communion. And... And, it's, and that's what we're about to do. And in its own way, it functions as a testimony to us, a tangible tasting, where we are reminded that our God is so loving and so active in our lives. We're reminded that he suffered and died for us. He entered into our suffering and pain and died just so that we could be reconciled to him and know him. That's the gospel That's the gospel. It's the most tangible testimony of his deep, deep love for you and for me and for your kids, for your coworkers, for your neighbors, for anyone. That is the most tangible testimony of his love, way beyond my experience that I just described. David knew deep sadness and suffering as a man of God. And he shouted from the rooftops when God delivered him. Jesus is even more familiar with your suffering with your hurt, your wounds, your feeling overwhelmed, your anxiety, your fill-in-the-blank. In the familiar passage from Isaiah 53, Isaiah puts it this way, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering, a man of suffering. Imagine if that's what people called you. Who knew what sickness was. 
He bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains. He was pierced because of our transgressions. That same Jesus who we remember when we take communion, we remember his torture and death for us, for our sake, so that we would be forgiven, but more than that, so that we would be whole, so that we could and would know God. And we remember that now. If you know Jesus, actively remember through this. If you know Jesus, actively remember through this. Speaking of psalms of thanksgiving, it's interesting that the theological word for communion used by scholars and theologians is the Eucharist. It's a big fancy word. But it's just Greek for thanksgiving. The table of thanksgiving. Friends, I invite you, remember him not only as the one who died for you, 2,000 years ago, but as the one who is in this room right now, speaking to you, drawing you, smiling on you, suffering with you. He hears. That is the conviction of the psalm of thanksgiving. That was David's conviction. He hears, and I'm going to tell you about it. He hears, he sees, he sees. In another psalm of thanksgiving, David says, taste and see that the Lord is good. If it's you who feels like I'm the one who's distant, I'm the one who feels like God answers that for other people but not for me, taste and see that the Lord is good.